Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. Here the word of God says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Well, tonight with the Lord's blessing, we take up a new Puritan study called Richard Baxter on Your Faults. Baxter's study is made up of two parts. First, he tells you how to get rid of bad thoughts, and then how to furnish your mind with good thoughts. The importance of not thinking bad thoughts and of thinking good thoughts is underlined by this simple fact, that what you think pretty much determines what you are. Another proverb says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Words can be faked. Deeds can be deceptive, but not false. What you think is what you really are. This means if you want to grow in grace, you've got to replace your bad thoughts with good thoughts. You know that, of course, but how do you do it? How do you move from the theory, which is so easy, the verse is so easy to quote, put off the old man and put on the new and so forth, to the practice of replacing bad thoughts with good ones. Well, the old peerage in Richard Baxter can help you on this one. Baxter wrote uh, literally dozens of books on almost every subject, and some of the books really were not worth the reprinting and shouldn't be read But when it comes to practical Christian living, when it comes to the nuts and bolts of living for Jesus Christ, Richard Baxter is the finest counselor that I've ever read. Now let's see what he has to say on this subject. He calls it general directions for furnishing the mind with good thoughts. Well, before we come to the how-to part of the study, let's be sure that we understand the terms. What are bad thoughts? Well, I suppose if you ask a hundred Christians, what are bad thoughts? I bet nearly all of them would say one of two things, sexual lust or bitter grudges. Uh, These are bad thoughts, of course, but they're not the only ones. Baxter has a very, very long list here. Here's only a sample of the list. First, he has evil thoughts about God. And remember, just because they're about God doesn't mean, well, they're okay. Evil thoughts against God are the evilest of all thoughts. And so here are some evil thoughts against God. He says, atheistic, blasphemous, idolatrous, and unbelieving thoughts. All thoughts that tend to disobedience or opposition to the will of God. All that savor of unthankfulness or a lack of love to God, or of discontent and distrust of God, all thoughts against any word of God, or particular duty, or part of his worship, all of these, Baxter says, are evil thoughts. Next he has evil thoughts about ourselves. What kind of thoughts about myself should I not think? Well, all thoughts of pride self-exalting ambition and covetousness. Then on to evil thoughts about other people, thoughts which are unjust and tend to the hurt of others, envy, malice, wrath, revenge, cruelty, being uncharitable, critical, and discouraging. All of these are evil thoughts. And then to top it all off, he says, one of the evilest of all thoughts is idle thoughts, just basically thinking about nothing worth thinking about. Bad thoughts, therefore, are not limited to fantasies of sex and revenge, but include every thought that displeases the Lord. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, you are to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, every thought without exception. But now, how do you do it? Again, how do you go from agreeing with me, ah, yeah, these are really bad thoughts, to doing something about these thoughts? Well, four things tonight. Number one, 
If you want to get rid of bad thoughts, remember how bad they are. Are bad thoughts really that bad? We say they are, but do we mean it? Do you resist evil thoughts with the same intensity as you resist evil deeds or words? You want to, because if the Bible is true, bad thoughts are really bad. First of all, bad thoughts are known to God. Ecclesiastes 12.14 says that God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. People have seen your bad actions. They've heard your bad words. But nobody has seen your bad thoughts. Nobody but God. But make no mistake about it. God has understood your bad thoughts with perfect clarity, the wicked motives, the proud desires, the malicious thoughts. All of these things God understands perfectly. God judges a man not by what he sees, but God looks inside of a man and knows what he really is. Bad thoughts are really bad because they're well known to a holy God. They're also judged by God. You know, back near the beginning of the Bible, we have the story of the flood. And this is not just a story to put children to bed by. It really happened. There really was a universal flood sweeping away the whole world of wickedness, saving nobody but Noah and his family. Well, why did the flood come onto the world? What was the cause of the flood? Well, you know, it wasn't so much the evil actions that men were doing as the evil thoughts that they were thinking. Genesis 6, 5 is very clear on this point. It says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Man is very, very wicked in the earth. All kinds of horrible things going on. But listen to the rest of the verse and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. Notice here, things that make the newspapers aren't mentioned. Murder, and rape, and child molesting, and arson, and horrible things. No, he says, no, God looked down on the world and saw mankind had completely corrupted itself because every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. They were living in a state of mental rebellion against God, and for that sin, God destroyed the world. Then you have to also add that wicked thoughts grieve the Lord. And this is no small thing. We grieve a loved one, and we feel ashamed of ourselves. How could I have done that to my dear mother? How could I have broken my son's heart? How could I have betrayed my husband or wife? We're grieved by grieving other people. Well, God is somebody. And grieving him is a very great and shameful sin. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Well, how do we grieve the Holy Spirit of God? Well, again, the verse before that tells us, It says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. That's one way we read God's Spirit. By saying dirty, gossipy, abusive things. But that's not all. He said, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, uh, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And so that's one way we grieve God's Spirit. By talking in an ungodly way. But then the next verse says that this is not the only way we grieve God's Spirit. It says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. This is another way. These are other ways that we grieve God's Spirit with things like bitterness, wrath, anger, malice. These are all faults. Every one of these is a fault. Some of them are translated into actions and words and some of them are not. But whether they're translated into actions or words or not is completely irrelevant at this point. The point is these things, malicious thoughts, bitter thoughts, Proud thoughts, these things grieve God's Spirit. 
And that's what makes bad thoughts so bad. And then again, I can also add, bad thoughts are so bad because they make holiness impossible. Bad thoughts make holiness impossible. The scribes and Pharisees were the religious leaders in Israel at the first century. And these men greatly valued holiness, at least they said they did. And because they so valued holiness, they tried to obtain it by constant praying, fasting, and giving alms to the poor. Every one of these things is commanded in the Bible. And they're good things to do. But you know, when the scribes and Pharisees did them, they didn't please God. And you know why? Because they were done to be seen of men. In other words, the thought behind the deed was bad. Consequently, these apparently good deeds were in fact wicked things. And so if bad faults grieve God, bring judgments upon men, and pollute the holiest works, they must be really bad. Remember that and you'll be more serious about getting rid of them. Here's Baxter on the subject. Do not forget what a great deal of sin is in the faults and how dangerous they are to your soul. So that's number one. Not only can bad things be done and said, but they can also be fought. Remember that. Number two, if you want to get rid of bad faults, stay away from the things that stir them up. If you want to get rid of bad thoughts, stay away from the things that stir them up. Some bad thoughts seem to come out of nowhere, and I think they do. I think some bad thoughts are directly planted there by Satan. But others are the result of looking at or listening to things you shouldn't be looking at or listening to. This includes pornography, of course, and gossip, and things more innocent, too. For example, if buying too much is your problem, stay away from the store, throw away the catalogs, and don't shop online. If that's your temptation. Maybe it's not your temptation. But if it is, take that advice. The Bible says covetousness is idolatry. And it goes on to say that the way we uh, resist idolatry is by seeing it, getting away from idolatry. Now, staying away from temptation will not rid you of every impure thought. The monks thought it would. They thought if you could get away from ungodly sights in the world and get into a cell in a monastery, that all would be well. But they forgot those ungodly thoughts went with them. So, staying away from temptation will not rid you of every impure thought. But if you don't stay away from temptation, your thought life can only become worse. Here's Baxter. Keep at a sufficient distance from those tempting objects, which are the fuel and incentive of your evil thoughts. That's the short word. Stay away from the things that fuel evil thoughts. And then he gives some examples. Can you expect that the drunkard should rule his thoughts while he is in the tavern? Is that a good place for a person with a drinking problem to stay? I'm not going to have a dream. I'm just going to sit here at the bar all day and sip Coca-Cola. Wrong. Or here's one that comes a little closer to home. Or that the glutton should rule his thoughts while the pleasing dish is in sight. I'm going to go on a diet. I promise tomorrow I'm going to start losing loads of weight. But in the meantime, I'm going to stare at a cream pie. Wrong. And then here's a third one. And here's an interesting word he uses. Or the lustful man should keep his thoughts chaste in the presence of his enamoring toy. <laughs> this means that a lustful man is looking at maybe a young woman whom he kind of likes a little bit too much and in the wrong way. And so can the man who is really battling sexual lust, should this guy spend a lot of time gawking at girls in bikinis? I don't think he should be doing that. So if you want to get rid of bad thoughts, stay away from the things that stir them up in you. Now, legalism wants to make everybody the same. If that's my temptation, it's your temptation. If you can't do it, then I can't do it. No, that's not right. Everyone is different. Everyone has his own set of temptations. 
I could live in a casino and not gamble because gambling is not my thing. But some people shouldn't get anywhere near the Nevada border. Everyone has his own set of temptations. And you know what yours are. Stay away from them as much as you can. Again, it's not possible to stay away from every temptation. The Lord has not willed to take us to heaven yet. Only heaven is a place where there are no temptations at all. But, again, you can do what you can do. You can't do everything. You can't blot out every possible temptation, but you can stay away from known temptations. There was an old preacher in the 19th century named Billy Bray, and speaking of ungodly thoughts, he said, you cannot keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. And I think he's really on to something there. So that's number two. If you want to get rid of bad thoughts, stay away from the things that stir up these bad thoughts. Number three. If you want to get rid of bad thoughts, keep a close eye on your senses. You know, we all have senses, five senses. We can see, we can hear, we can touch, we can taste, we can smell. These senses are gifts of God, of course, and they're good for us. But we have to use our senses wisely. The ears that can listen to the very best sermon can also listen to the very worst gossip. Thus, you've got to be careful what you listen to, what you look at, and what you touch, taste, or smell. Again, temptations differ from person to person. There's a very, very famous book called Holy War, and it's written by John Bunyan. And this, in this book, there is an assault on a city called Man's Soul. Uh, Bunyan's not real subtle. He makes it pretty clear. Man's Soul is a city. And the enemy attacked the city through eye gate and ear gate. And Bunyan was trying to teach us that there are things that come through here which get into our minds and pollute us. There are other things that go through here, get into our minds, and pollute us. And so you've got to respect that. That your senses are gifts of God, but like every other gift, your senses can be put to wrong use. Now, that's not easily done. And this is not a, this, you know, like turning over your hand. This is not easy to do. It's not easy to do, especially now when we're surrounded by advertising and almost no censorship of any kind. But do it we must if we want our thoughts to please Jesus Christ. Now, the best time to guard against, uh, guard your senses is ahead of time. Don't wait for the temptation to hit you um, and then try to resist it. Make that decision before the temptation comes up. I mean, if you know it's coming up. That's what Job did. Job 31 verse 1 says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why should I look upon a maid? See, Job made an agreement with his eyes. And the agreement is, don't look at pretty girls. Job was an old man. But he was still a man. And he found women attractive. He said, don't look. Job was the holiest man in the world. And yet even he realized that he couldn't look and stare and gawk and not be affected. That's what Job did. And he sets a good example for us. And again, this is not a one-time decision. It has to be done every day. Before you go to work or school in the morning, say, I'm not going to look at certain things. I'm not going to listen to certain things, and so on. And don't just say it. Pray about it. Ask the Lord to help you. Psalm 119, verse 37 is a good verse to memorize. Turn away my eyes from beholding vanity, and revive me in your way. Here we're enlisting the help of God. We're saying, you know, Lord, when... I go to these places, when I go to work, innocent places I'm going to, there are, there's gossip going on, there's advertising I shouldn't see, there are things like these coming at me in all directions. Lord, you turn my eyes away from beholding vanity. I'll do everything I can, but Lord, what I can't do, you come and do for me. Baxter says, keep your senses obedient if you want to have obedient thoughts. All know by experience how powerfully the senses move the thoughts. 
Open not the door to sinful things if you would not have them come in. Now that's very good advice. If you don't want robbers and thieves to come into your house, keep your door locked. And if you don't want evil thoughts getting into your mind, keep your eyes and ears and so forth off those places that are likely to stir up the evil thoughts. That's number three. And here's the last one. If you want to get rid of bad thoughts, remember where bad thoughts lead. If you want to get rid of bad thoughts, remember where they lead, where they take you. What does the Bible say about bad thoughts? Well, it says, lust, when it is conceived, brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death, James 1.15. Now, a good example here in the Bible is a man named Achan. Achan was um, a soldier in Israel. He crossed the Jordan River, fought at the Battle of Jericho. Now, the rule was laid down before the Battle of Jericho that this city was a cursed place, and that nobody was to take any loot out of the city. They were to destroy everything in the city and leave it all there. Now, God, of course, caused the walls of Jericho to come tumbling down, and the armies of Israel went in and just wiped out the whole city, and nobody touched anything. Well, nobody except Achan. A little bit later, Israel fought against the city of Ai, and over 30 men were killed in the battle. And Joshua, the leader of Israel, goes to the Lord to find out what's wrong, why this happened. And the Lord says there's sin in the camp, that somebody in Israel touched that cursed thing in Jericho. And Joshua, you're not going to have my blessing until that man is found, convicted, and executed. And so they went through a long series of things to find out who the man was. And finally, the man was discovered His name was Achan, and Achan said where the stuff was buried, and they dug it up, and they brought out three things. They brought out a bag of silver, they brought out a gold wedge, and they brought out a Babylonian coat. Joshua then said, Achan, give glory to God. Tell us what you've done. And here's what he said. I saw, I coveted, I took. I looked at it, I wanted it, I took it. And then, of course, he and his whole family were stoned to death for that sin. But here a whole family dies, and more than 30 other men also die, just because a man didn't think that bad thoughts would have any bad consequences in his life. But they do. They really do. Lust, sin, death. That's the pattern. Now, this does not always happen, thank God. Not every angry thought leads to murder. Not every lustful thought leads to adultery. Not every greedy thought leads to theft. But you know, just about every murder comes from an angry thought. Just about every act of adultery comes from a lustful thought. And just about every theft comes from a covetous thought. Now, I know what I'm talking about here. I have a very good friend who who fell into adultery. He's a good man. He's a Christian man. He fell into it just a one-time act. And after he repented of his sin, I came over and talked to him about it. I said, what happened? You know what he said? He said, well, one thing led to another. That doesn't sound like much of an answer, but it really is a very good answer. One thing led to another. First he had fantasies. And he followed those up with playful words, little flirtatious. Then he followed those up by some little innocent hugging. Then he followed that up by some things that weren't so innocent. He's a good man. I'm not making this up. He's a good man who does love Jesus Christ, but he didn't keep the heart. One thing led to another. Ah, what's it hurt? A few lustful thoughts. Never led to anything too bad, huh? Ask my friend. He'd say otherwise. And so, do you want to be that kind of person? You want to be involved in scandalous sins? You want to betray your wife? You want to devastate your kids? You want to ruin your reputation? You want to get arrested? If you don't, then you've got to stop thinking lustful or covetous or angry thoughts. Because that's where the sins start. They start in the mind. Here's the Puritan. 
Remember how near kin or how closely related. Remember how closely related the thought is to the deed and what a tendency it has to it. In other words, the momentum. There's momentum in these things. Thoughts, sins, death. Momentum. Now, Richard Baxter has a lot more to say on this subject, but this is enough for tonight. If you want to overcome bad faults, just remember, one, how bad they are, two, stay away from the things that tempt you to them, three, keep a close watch on your senses, and four, remember where bad faults are going to take you if you're not very careful. This is godly counsel. It really is. It's godly counsel because, although I quoted Richard Baxter repeatedly tonight, his counsel comes right out of the Bible. This is godly counsel. Now you're responsible to do something with it. And what you're to do with it is to obey it. May the grace and power of Jesus Christ be with you in your obedience. For, Christ's, for, for God's sake, amen. Proverbs 4, and the verse is number 23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Tonight, with God's blessing, we'll proceed in our study of Richard Baxter on your thoughts. Richard Baxter was an English pastor who lived from 1619 to 1691. Like everyone else, he had his weaknesses. But when it comes to pastoral counseling, or telling Christians how to live every day for the Lord, Richard Baxter was the best. His study is divided into two parts. The first is negative, how to get rid of bad thoughts. The second is positive, how to keep the good thoughts you have and improve upon them. He begins by defining bad thoughts. They are thoughts against God, such as unbelief and discontent. Thoughts against yourself, especially pride. And thoughts against other people, like malice or envy or contempt. These are all bad thoughts. But knowing what a bad thought is, is a lot different than getting rid of one. How do you do that? How do you expel these bad thoughts? Assuming you recognize them as bad, assuming you know that a grudge is wicked, or that uh, fantasies are sinful, what do you do with them? How do you get rid of them? Well, thus far, Baxter has said four things. Number one, you've got to remember how bad they are. Thoughts matter to God. All humans can do is judge words and deeds. But God can judge thoughts and they matter very uh, much to Him. Number two, stay away from the things that stir them up. If looking at things stir up bad thoughts, don't look at things. If talking to certain people stir up bad thoughts, don't talk to those people as far as practical. And so stay away from the things that stir them up. Keep a close eye on your senses. And remember where bad thoughts will take you if you're not careful. James 1.15 says, Lust, when it is conceived, brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Achan saw, he coveted, he took, and he died. That's the review. Let's move on now to the other points under this negative part of Baxter's study. If you want to get rid of bad thoughts, control your emotions. If you want to get rid of bad thoughts, control your emotions. Not everyone is emotional, but some people are. Those of us who are emotional have to keep a careful check on our emotions. We've got to keep our foot on the brake pedal or we're going to be in very big trouble. 
Now, in theory, your mind controls your feelings. You think something is good and you feel happy about it. You think something is dangerous and you feel scared. That's the theory, but the facts are not always that way. Very often, your feelings drive your thoughts. You become mad at someone, for example, and you begin thinking all kinds of evil things against them, often without any proof or maybe no evidence at all. Your angry feelings are making you think wicked thoughts. Rather than controlling your emotions, your mind is being controlled by them, and that's bad. Not that emotions are bad. Arms are good, but not for walking. Eyes are good, but not for smelling. Emotions are good, but not for thinking. How do you control your emotions? Well, that's another subject, of course, but here's a good place to start. First, respect the power and danger of uncontrolled emotions. Second, pray for God's grace to control them. And third, don't cop out by saying, well, that's just the way I am. Maybe it is the way you are, but grace changes you from what you are to what you ought to be. Here's the quote from Richard Baxter. Keep out or quickly cast out all inordinate passions, for passions violently press the thoughts and forcibly carry them away. If anger or grief or fear or pleasure be allowed in, they will command your thoughts. And when you rebuke your thoughts and call them in, they will not hear you till you get them away from the crowd and noise of passion. Emotions are like screaming kids. Until you quiet them down, you can't be heard. If you want to get rid of your bad thoughts, control your emotions. Don't let your feelings do your thinking for you. That's number one. Number two. If you want to get rid of bad thoughts, resist them as soon as they occur to you. If you want to get rid of bad thoughts, resist them as soon as they occur to you. Bad thoughts are like tigers. If you're going to tame them, you better start early. When they're cubs, you can do something with them, but let them grow up wild and that tiger will tear you to pieces. When applied to thinking, this means don't let your flash of anger grow into bitterness or resentment. Don't let your passing lust grow into a fantasy. Kill the thoughts early. The longer you wait to mortify them, the harder it becomes. Here's the quote from Baxter. Cast out vain and sinful thoughts in the beginning before they settle themselves and make a dwelling in the heart. They are most easily and safely resisted at the doorway. Bad thoughts are like Jehovah's Witnesses. Once you let them in the house, it's hard to get them out. Better to keep them out than to try to throw them out once they're in. Proverbs 1.10 makes the point, My son, if sinners entice you, consent not. In other words, if sinful thoughts entice you, don't think about them a little bit longer. Don't weigh the pluses and minuses of them. Don't sleep on them and say, or anything like that. Just say no to them. If an evil thought entices you, stand up to that thought right then. The Bible makes a wonderful promise to us. It says, if you resist the devil, he will flee. When you were in school, did you know bullies? Most bullies are all talk and no action. Most of them are that way. And as long as they've got you cowering, they're going to take advantage of you. They're going to take your lunch money every day. But if you stand up to them, maybe you don't even have to fight. If you stand up to the bullies, often they'll back down. And Satan is this way. Satan loves to bully us. He loves to win fights without throwing a punch. But when we resist the devil, God gives us special grace that enables us to not only resist him, but to resist him successfully. That doesn't mean he gives up instantly and never comes back. I wish it did mean that. But it does mean that temptation itself fails. You can give thanks to God and see that Satan is the defeated foe. And so if you want to get rid of bad thoughts, 
Resist them as soon as they occur to you. That's number two. Number three is this. If you want to get rid of bad thoughts, keep a tender conscience. Now, what's a tender conscience? Well, a tender conscience is one that's sensitive to sin, even itsy-bitsy, little, teeny-tiny sins. Some people feel guilty, but only after they've committed some big, whopping, scandalous sin. The Bible says these people have seared their consciences with a hot iron. They've deadened the feelings, sort of a, a novocaine shot of sin, which deadens you to everything you should be feeling. But this is not the way to holiness, to harden your conscience. No, the way of holiness goes in the opposite direction. You see, if little sins hurt you, you'll repent of them before they grow into big sins. And that's what the function of a tender conscience is. It aims to feel the little sins and repent of them before they become big sins. And here, there's quite an example in the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, David was, of course, the king of Israel, but he wasn't always king. He wasn't born king. Uh, In fact, when David was a young man, the king of Israel was a man named Saul. And although David was Saul's most faithful and successful servant, Saul hated him with a bitter envy and spent a good many years hunting down David, trying to kill him. Now you see, Saul had been appointed by God to be the king of Israel for the purpose of fighting Israel's battles against the Philistines. But Saul had no time for the real enemies of the Lord. He spent all of his time fighting God's friend, David. And so for many years, David had to flee the presence of Saul and really live on the land. For a number of years, David was uh, a fugitive from justice. And Saul intended to kill David. He wasn't trying to arrest him and give him a fair trial. His goal was to put a spear through his heart. That's what he was trying, that's what he was up to. Well, one night, David and some of his men were hiding in a cave, way in the back of a cave. And Saul came to the cave and he left his men outside and he went inside the cave to relieve himself. David and his men are right there. Saul is completely vulnerable. He's got no weapons. He's got no men. He's taking care of private business. And David's men are going, Now's your chance. Now's your chance. Get him. You got him now. The Lord has delivered him into your hand. And David drew his sword and cut off the hem of Saul's garment. Cut a little piece of fabric out of his shirt. Later Saul finished up his business and he and his men went on and then David went off to another place and then from a long ways away uh, he yelled out to Saul. Uh, David did. And he said, My master is, look at this. Isn't this part of your garment? Can't you see that that the Lord handed you over to me, but I didn't kill you. And that means I had no intent to kill you. All right, well, why did he do that? I mean, the man is right there. Why didn't he kill him? And why did he confess this to to Saul? Well, the answer is, David's conscience smote him. He felt guilty. He said, who am I to stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed? This is a man trying to kill him. You could have argued that it was nothing but self-defense. And certainly it was not killing a, a good man, it was killing a killer. And yet David's conscience was so sensitive at the time that even something like cutting off a part of that man's shirt tail smote his conscience. Now if you keep your conscience tender about bad faults, the faults won't be very bad, they won't stay very long, and they won't get much worse. You'll slip at times, of course. Everyone does. But you won't wallow in wicked thoughts. You won't just turn 
thoughts of revenge over and over and over in your mind. Some people have sort of a rosary of revenge going over and over like the little beads, you know, over and over. Every bad thing someone has done to me. He said this and she did that and he did the other and they excluded me and that sort of thing. That can't be pleasing to the Lord. And if you keep your conscience tender, you won't do such a thing. Here's the quote from the old Puritan. Keep your conscience tender that you be not insensitive to the smallest sin. A tender conscience fears and departs from evil. That's number three. If you want to get rid of bad thoughts, keep your conscience tender. You do that, of course, by reading the Bible regularly, finding out what sin is, confessing your sins regularly to the Lord, and practicing self-examination. Number four. If you want to get rid of bad thoughts, just think of how embarrassed you would be if others knew about them. Now, this is a very clever point. I think Baxter is really trying to tattoo something in our brains on this one. If you want to get rid of bad thoughts, just think of how embarrassed you would be if others knew about them. I don't need to say very much here. What if you had a brain disorder that made you say everything you thought? Well, you'd be the most hated person in the world. Somebody would say something to you, and you'd say, Man, you're stupid! Or you'd walk up to a guy and say, Hey, your wife looks hot tonight. Uh-uh, wrong. No, 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 no. You'd be the most hated and embarrassed person in the world. You know why, of course. Because some things shouldn't be said. And if they shouldn't be said, well, they shouldn't be thought either. If it's wrong to say these things, it's also wrong to think these things. And it's especially wrong to dwell on these things. Think about this and maybe it will expel some of your bad thoughts. Baxter says, think seriously of how much you would control your thoughts if they were written on your forehead. What if your thoughts were subtitled? What if someone can push a button and give a close caption of what you were thinking? You'd be a whole lot more careful about what you were thinking than you are now. Keep that in mind. That's number four. And here's the last one. If you want to get rid of bad thoughts, just remember, every one of them is open to God and will be uncovered on the day of judgment. What if your thoughts were broadcast? What if they were uh, subtitled? Well, they are subtitled. They are broadcast. Now, people don't get that frequency, but God does. He hears or sees or knows your thoughts. Nothing will sober you up faster than knowing that God knows what you're thinking and the day of judgment is coming and that on that day everything you've done, said, or thought will be brought to light. Baxter says so. Remember what an opening of thoughts there will be on the day of judgment. Then you will be ashamed to see what filth and vanity you entertained. And the Bible says the same thing in the last two verses of Ecclesiastes. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every uh, thing into judgment, including every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And that includes your thoughts. And so, remember that your thoughts are an open book to God. And He reads them very carefully, every word of them, and he never forgets them. The last one is this. If you want to get rid of bad thoughts, don't despair when you fail. If Satan can't make you insensitive to your sins, he'll make you too sensitive. In other words, he'll make you feel guilty and polluted all the time. He'll make you think there's no hope for Christ in you and that you're beyond repentance. No one can live this way. If you try you'll soon give up all hope and every effort for holiness. Nobody can live in guilt. Bad thoughts are bad. They're much worse than we think they are. But remember, the sinfulness of thoughts is not greater than the grace of God. The Bible says that where sin abounded, grace 
super about it. Your thoughts may be full of every kind of filthiness and vanity and unbelief in the world, but the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. He is eager to forgive the worst sinner. He is eager to forgive the person who honestly confesses his sins to the Lord and tries to forsake them. Proverbs 28.13 has never been repealed. He who covers his sin shall not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes it will have mercy. And neither is John 1, 1 John 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That means when you've messed up once a day, you can confess. But it's also true when you've messed up a hundred times a day, you can confess. When you've entertained the same, if, when you've entertained a bad thought once, confess it to the Lord and get mercy. And when you've entertained that same thought for the one thousandth time, confess it and receive mercy from the Lord. Repent of your sinful thinking, of course, but don't wallow in your guilt. For if you've confessed it honestly to the Lord and sought forgiveness through Jesus Christ, whose death is sufficient to wash away all of your guilt and sin, you've been forgiven and you've been cleansed. Not because I said so, not because psychology says so, because God Himself says so. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. When you... Here's what Baxter says about it. When you find that some thoughts of sin and vanity are following you still, implying that you've tried to overcome it. But when you find that some thought of vanity and sin is following you still, for all that you can do, you must not plunge your souls into discouragement, but wait on God. Wait on God. To forgive, to cleanse. And remember... I've talked to people over the years who have battled certain kinds of faults, perverted faults in some cases, general unbelieving faults in other cases. They've battled these faults for years and years and years. They may never completely overcome these faults in this life, but this life is not the end. There's a new world coming in which Christians will reign and rule and serve with Jesus Christ. And in that world, every bad thought will be sponged out of your mind and replaced with the most wonderful thoughts of love and peace and joy. Cornelius Van Til died a few years ago. He was for decades, 60 years or more, professor of apologetics at um, Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. And as an old man, now Van Til was sharp. I mean, this man was a razor. But as an old man, he had a big shock of white hair, tall, thin man, very distinguished looking. A student asked him, Dr. Van Til, what are the special temptations of old age? And Van Til smiled and said, young man, he said, the sins of my old age are the sins of my youth. The same thoughts that plagued him when he was a little boy in Holland plagued him when he was an old man in Philadelphia. And we grow in grace, but we don't reach perfection in this world. And not to worry, this world is not the only world. Believers are going to heaven. I mean, we're really going to be with God. And how exactly God is going to sponge all of those bad thoughts out of our minds without somehow changing our personalities, I, I don't know. But I suspect this is the answer. I suspect one look at his face will be just so wonderful and so filling that all of these bad thoughts will be seen for what they really are, unworthy of thinking about. So if you, don't want, if you want to get rid of bad thoughts, don't despair when you fail, but keep on trusting and looking to the Lord for mercy. Here's the last verse. It comes from the Psalm, uh, the last verse of Psalm 130. Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy. With the Lord there is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquity. Your thoughts bothering you? Wicked thoughts pressing, throwing out good ones? Dwelling on something wicked? Do these things in faith, 
This is not a formula. This is not a magic pill. This is not a, what is it, five or six step program. Do these things in faith, looking to, looking to God to bless them. And these things will help you expel the bad thoughts that are there by nature and choice and rein in the good thoughts that are there by grace. May God make you and me both doers of his word for Christ's sake. Amen. Let's pray, please. Heavenly Father, dear Lord, it's an embarrassing thing to talk to you when you know our hearts and every evil fault that has passed through them. We can't pose for you, Lord. We can't fake it before you. And so, Lord, we don't try to fake it. We confess to you that our minds are just a knot of bad thoughts. And yet, Lord, we also recognize that you are very merciful and gracious. That you remember our weaknesses and you forgive our sins. We also thank you, Lord, for planting the seed of grace in our minds. And that our minds are not as corrupt as they used to be. That our thoughts are still shameful and embarrassing, but, well, they're getting better by your grace. And they will get better because you're with us and your spirit will not leave us and heaven awaits us. So, Lord, we ask you, for Christ's sake, to forgive all of our bad faults. Fill our minds with things that are worthy of being thought about. Thank you again, Lord, for each one who's come. I pray the word of God will be both a nutritious and delectable meal for them tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask these favors. Amen. Philippians 4, verse 8 says, Finally, my brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble... Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Well, tonight, with God's blessing, we'll continue our study of Richard Baxter on your faults. Richard Baxter was the greatest of the Puritans, I think. He was born in 1619 and died in 1691. His complete writings are now available in four huge volumes about that thick, a thousand pages each volume, small print, double column. But the best thing he ever wrote, it seems to me, is a book called A Christian Directory in which he deals with just about every practical subject that you can imagine. And we've spent how long? One year, maybe? We've spent at least several months studying Richard Baxter, and we'll continue doing that tonight. Now, thus far in this study, we've learned how to get rid of your bad thoughts. Now we come to the positive side, how to stock your mind with good thoughts and improve the ones you have. It's important to do this because what you think pretty much determines what you are. That means if you want to grow in grace, you've got to start with your mind, for out of it spring the issues of life. Now, how do you get good thoughts into your mind? Well, the old Puritan can help you on this one. He has several things to say under the heading, three of which we'll look at tonight. The first is the most obvious, and also the one we're most apt to forget. Here it is. If you want to think good thoughts, read the Bible. On this point, I cannot improve on what Richard Baxter has to say, so I'll quote him at length. Baxter says, Scripture is the glass through which you may see the other world. There you may see the ancient of days, the eternal majesty shining in his glory, and Christ reigning as king of all the world with the angels of God worshiping him and the eternal spirit. Search the holy scriptures and acquaint yourself well with the oracles of God and you will find abundant matter for your faults. If you cannot find enough for your mind among all these heights and depths, it is because you never understood them 
or set your heart to search them out. What mysterious doctrines, how sublime and heavenly, are there for you to meditate on as long as you live? What a perfect law, what terrible warnings, what wonderful histories of love and mercy, what holy examples, what a treasury of precious promises, what full and free expressions of pardon to believing sinners. In a word, the character of our God, our Redeemer, our inheritance, and the law by which we must be governed are there before us for daily meditation. David, who had much less of the scripture than we do, said, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day long. So if you want to think good thoughts, you've got to start at the source of all goodness, and that is God. Go to his word with faith and love and a willingness to obey. Admit your ignorance and ask him to dispel it. When you don't know what he's saying, keep at it until you do. In short, study to show yourself approved to God. If you haven't read the Bible all the way through, start tonight and start on page one. If you read about three chapters a day, you can read the whole Bible in one year. This first reading will not give you much depth of understanding, but that's okay. You've got to start somewhere. By reading the whole Bible through, you get a feel for the whole story, for the big idea. After you've done that, read the books of John and Romans more carefully. The former gives us the best picture of Christ. The latter shows the way of salvation most fully. Read the Bible, but don't leave it there. The goal of reading the Bible is not reading the Bible. It's furnishing your mind with good thoughts. That means you've got to think about what you're reading. If you've got a good memory, memorize one verse a day and turn it over and over in your mind. If your memory is bad, get the big idea of a verse and think about the big idea during the day. How do you meditate on God's Word? How do you think about anything with any concentration? In this age of television, this age of non-reading, this age of headlines, hardly anybody knows how to really meditate on something. How do you do that? How do you get a verse in your mind and allow that verse to, well, to ferment and to turn into something good? How do you turn the verse over and over in your mind until it gets into your blood, so to speak? How do you do that? Well, on this point, you've got to go back another about 100 years in church history. Remember, Baxter was born in 1619. If you go back about 130 years before that, you meet another character named Martin Luther. Martin Luther, the great German reformer, is very helpful here. One day he was sitting in a barber chair, and his barber was shaving him, and he said, Dr. Luther, how do you pray? And Luther went home and wrote his barber, Peter Beskendorf, a 40-page letter explaining how he prayed. And he said that the key to prayer is not thinking up beautiful words, but meditation. And that's really our subject, right? Meditation. And so Luther gave a long treatise, about 40 pages, on meditation. Speaking of the Ten Commandments, he said, I take... Each commandment, first as a teaching, which is what it actually is. Secondly, I make out a reason for thanksgiving. Thirdly, a confession. Fourthly, a prayer petition. Now, Martin Luther didn't say everybody had to do this, but it worked for him, and for what it's worth, it's been very helpful to me also. Let me give you an example of this, how to actually do it. And I have chose the shortest verse in the Bible. John 11.35 says, Jesus wept. Now, that's a scripture you can memorize. Jesus wept. Okay? You start with the teaching. What does the verse mean? It means the Lord grieves at death and at other human pains and losses. Think about that. Then you go on to the duty. What does this verse tell me to do? 
tells me to feel compassion for people who are hurting. Think about that. Next is the thanksgiving. Why should I be grateful that Jesus wept? Answer, because he cares for me. You don't weep for people you don't care about. You weep only for people you love. And so Jesus wept means Jesus cares for me. Jesus Christ loves me. And that's something to give thanks for. And lastly, we have the confession. What have I done wrong in light of this verse? Answer, I've not sympathized very deeply with people who are suffering. Using this method, one verse or even a word or two can fill your mind with good thoughts all day long and a lot more than one day. And so read the Bible, read it all the way through, read selected parts of the Bible over and over again, but remember, your your meditation isn't over when you close the Bible. In fact, your meditation is only starting. Close the Bible after reading it, and begin turning these ideas over and over in your mind. One more tip. In reading the Bible, stay balanced. We all have favorite parts of the Bible. I do too. And we tend to stay with these favorite parts while skipping or rushing through the other parts. This is not helpful. The Bible provides a balanced diet, but only if you read it all. I talked to a woman one day who was always depressed. I asked her if she read her Bible, and she said, Yes, I do. I read the Bible every day. What's your favorite book? I inquired. Ah, my favorite book is the book of Ecclesiastes. How often do you read that? Well, I read it almost every day. There's your problem. She was reading the Bible, but she was reading one part of the Bible over and over and over again. And it's not the part of the Bible that's likely to be particularly helpful if your tendency is to depression. What's the first verse of Ecclesiastes? Vanity of vanity. All is vanity, says the preacher. Emptiness of emptiness. All is empty. Meaninglessness of meaninglessness. Everything is meaningless. Here you are, a depressed person. You're reading that every day. I think that's going to give you a you know, quick buzz. It's really going to cheer you up. Not very likely. I told her to quit reading the book of Ecclesiastes for a while and go over and read the Gospels and read the Gospels until she knew and felt the love of Jesus Christ for sinners. If this man receives publicans and harlots and all kinds of just atrocious people, this man will receive her too. And so you've got to be honest with yourself and you've got to read the Bible in a balanced way. Be honest with yourself. If you need reproof, go to those parts of the Bible that bawl you out. If you need comfort, go to the parts of the Bible that give you cheer. If you need just straight instruction, teaching, go to those parts that give you straight teaching and so on. And so, if you want to think good thoughts, read the Bible. Read it and read it and read it until you've absorbed the Bible. You know, John Bunyan was one of the great geniuses in English history, although he never went to school and had read probably only a handful of books his whole life, he wrote one of the greatest English classics called uh, Pilgrim's Progress. And Bunyan, if you read Pilgrim's Progress, you see almost every allusion in Pilgrim's Progress is to the Bible. Almost every one of them is. And it was said about Bunyan that when you cut John Bunyan, he bled Bibline because he read the Bible over and over and over again. And so, if you want to think good thoughts, start by reading the Bible. Number one. Number two. If you want to think good thoughts, open your eyes to creation. Baxter says, The world and every creature in it which you daily see and which reveals to you the great creator is enough to keep your mind from all idleness. Everything you see around you, 
everything reveals some aspect of God's glory. Romans 1.20 says that God's invisible attributes are clearly seen by the things that are made. Now, you can't see his invisible attributes, that's why they're invisible. But his invisible attributes are clearly seen in looking at visible things. Now, these words are often applied to the wonders of nature. Mighty waterfalls, deep canyons, soaring mountains, and so on. And, of course, these things do evoke sacred falls. But you don't need Niagara Falls or the Grand Canyon or Mount Everest to see the glory of God in creation. It's everywhere. In the warm sun, in the cool breeze, in the blooming flower, in the red tomato, in the sleek cat, in the loyal dog. Everything is charged with the love and the glory of God. I told this story a few weeks ago, but let me repeat it. A couple of years ago, I was in Italy. We had been a couple of nights in Milan, which is way up in the north. And Milan looks kind of like the Italian Los Angeles. It's not really a beautiful place. And so I came down from our hotel room. I was out walking around. I walked by this really awful, stinky dumpster. Ooh, revolting. But I noticed something. There was a bougainvillea vine growing around the dumpster and kind of, you know, twining its way around it. The color of the flower was sort of violet, fuchsia, some indescribable color, some color of the most exquisite beauty. And when I saw that, I said, there is a God. I mean, I saw God in a dumpster, but what would you expect to see him? His son was laid in a manger. God's glory can be seen everywhere. You don't have to go to Yosemite. You don't have to go to Niagara Falls. You can see the glory of God just everywhere you look. Remember that, and you'll always have something good to think about. Even when you close your eyes. How about that? You know, when you close your eyes, you still see, but what you see is the inside of your eyelids, right? Even when you close your eyes, you can see something of God's glory because God created darkness. And that itself is a great blessing. Could you imagine living in a world where the sun never went down? The relentless light would make you lose your mind. It's one of the techniques they use in prisoners of war, for example. You can't sleep, at least not well, under constant light. Close your eyes. All you see is darkness. And even that reminds you of the glory of God and His great love in giving us the gift of darkness. And so if you want to think good thoughts, open your eyes to creation or even close your eyes to creation. You don't have to look very carefully because the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. It's not like over in this little corner, over in that remote place, way up in that distant mountain. The glory of God is everywhere, all around us. Open your eyes to creation. You'll have something worth thinking about. Number three, if you want to think good thoughts, remember how many mercies you've received today. Baxter says, Overlook not that life full of particular mercies which God has bestowed on you, and you will find pleasant and profitable matter for your thoughts. What he's saying here is this. Count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. If you want to think grateful, God-honoring thoughts, just go over the mercies you've received today. You'll be amazed at the number of them, their quality. And if you've got an ounce of humility in you, you'll be struck by how undeserving you are of even the littlest blessing, no less the biggest. Every thought, every breath, every heartbeat, every brain wave, every one of these things is a mercy communicated to us by the grace of God. Every one of them. Remember, God doesn't have to Stop your heart from beating. 
No, your heartbeat depends on God. It's not that he has to intervene and make it stop. All he's got to do is remove the communication of his grace and it stops. The psalmist shouted, Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with all benefits. Did you catch the word he chose? God doesn't throw a few crumbs our way or sprinkle a favor on us now and then. He daily loads us with all benefits. Do you know how much God has given you? No, you don't. No, you don't. You could be the most introspective person in the world. You could be the most fastidious, record-keeping guy in the world. Keeping records of just every little thing. And you wouldn't even scratch the surface on the number of blessings that God has given you in the last half hour. God has given you an immense number of blessings of the highest quality and they're all undeserved. Let me add this. God has given you more than he's given his angels. Did you know that? God has given you more than he's given his angels. Because when God became a creature, he didn't choose to become an angel. He assumed human nature. The angels have many blessings, but they've got nothing to compare to a Redeemer who looks just like us. Wow! He's given to us all things which pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. All things are yours. Just think about what God has given you and how undeserving you are of His blessings. You do that even just a little bit, just even a little tiny bit. You don't have to do this 18 hours a day. You do this just a little teeny tiny bit and your mind will burst with grateful and adoring thoughts. Well, that's enough for tonight. Let me recap. God wants you to think good thoughts. To help you do it, he's given you his word, creation, and a million mercies every minute. Now put these good things to use. Read the Bible. Celebrate creation. Count your blessings. And the love of God be with you all for Christ's sake. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word which is able to make us wise for salvation. Thank you for creating the world in such a way as to reflect on your glory. By the workmanship, one knows the worker. And we look at the workmanship of this world, even fallen and marred as it is, and we can't but admire the greatness, the glory, the power, the creative genius and the love of our Creator. And thank you, Lord, for the mercies that you daily load upon us. Mercies we can't count. If we had calculators, we couldn't count them. Not computers could count the number of mercies that we receive every day. And Lord, we don't deserve even one of them. Lord, we don't deserve even one of them. And yet you've given us millions every hour. Father, I do pray now that you would enable us to think good thoughts, things that are pure and honest and just and things that are praiseworthy, virtuous things, and that you would evict the bad thoughts which so often barge their way into our minds and sometimes we welcome them into our minds. Father, I pray now you'd bless the study of Richard Baxter in the weeks to come and that you would give us grace to become doers of the word and not just hearers or preachers of it. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.